everybody and welcome to our morning service. Let's just pray and pray. Praise the Lord, all you nations, extol him, all you peoples, for great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Lord, as we come to you this morning, we want to be able to praise you and offer our thanks and bring our petitions and hear your word. And we do pray, Lord, that everything we do will be acceptable to you because we ask it in our Saviour's name. Amen. Amen. But those words I uh, said earlier, by the way, they're from a hum, hum, Psalm 117, and it's the whole psalm, of course, it's the shortest in the book. Morning to you all, and uh, enjoy the sun, oh, I've got it, I did see it rise this morning, as I know somebody else probably did as well, it looks as if it rose out of water this morning, but it uh, does not see it quite like that. As you see, Roger is leaving the service this morning, he wants to do some jam and marble class for the children and young people. 6pm tonight. We are concluding the series on Ruth on the video from Midfield Evangelical Church. I see from the date of it, it was from the 13th of December last year. And they'd, uh, oh, it was nearly Christmas and they got their Christmas decorations up and they were still looking at Ruth. Tuesday, Prayer and Bible study at 7.30. Wednesday, 6 p.m. Boys Club and Youth Club 7.30. Friday, Girls Brigade starts again at 6.30. And then next Sunday in the morning, 16th of January, it's uh, 10.30 for us here, German Bible class, and communion will be part of that service and I will be leaving it. Then 6 p.m. it's TBA. There will be a service, but who's speaking or what we do will be uh, to be decided. Streets to remember in prayer this week were into the H's, Haven Gore Close, Haven Side and Havering Close. UEC Church to remember in prayer is the one at Dawes Heath. And the missionary focus was a couple of things here. It says Jeremy Nash is in Burkino Faso from the 6th of January. But our general for remembering prayers this week is the London City Mission, LCM. There are a few other dates for your diary, which is on the prayer letter here. But one I will, uh, one is that, well, I'll go through them all. Committee meeting meets tomorrow somewhere. On Monday the 24th of January we have a visit from Nigel by Litho on ways to evangelise. I've got that down as 7.30. I think that's on Monday. And uh, Thursday the 27th of January is a uh, 7.30 is the church meeting. That's where we're due to hold it. Thank you. We now come to a, a time of Intercessory prayer, let us all pray. Our dear Lord God and Father, as we come to you this morning, we realise again we come to a, a holy God. A God whom we could never approach in our own right. But Lord, through the work of your Son, we can draw near to you. And we praise and thank you for this. We want to praise you and thank you, Lord, for so much that you've done. But most of all, Lord, for bringing us to yourself. We do acknowledge again our unworthiness in your sight. And Lord, we know daily we offend you. We sin against you and we confess, Lord, this before you. And ask again for that, pro for that forgiveness which is promised to us in your word. That if we confess, you are faithful to forgive. And we thank you for that as we do now. As we come humbly to you, Lord, and bring our needs and the needs of others before you. We're concerned about 
many things in these trying and difficult days in which we live. And Lord, as we look around, we see all around us and daily as we hear the news, we see that and hear the, the devastation caused by sin. And Lord, we know that it's a world that is turning more and more against you. Oh Lord, we are conscious of so many needs so close to us as well, perhaps in our own fellowship, our own families, our own lives. And we do want to bring these need, needs before you, Lord. We do pray at this time, particularly in our own land, for those that have the authority over us. Whatever they are, Lord, we know that and whoever they are, we are commanded in your word to pray for them. Lord, and we, and we do, and we still pray, Lord, that we might see something of a, a return to you. But, but Lord, that uh, there will be those amongst those in authority who will recognise their accountability. Uh, to you. Lord, we particularly pray at this time for those who have lost loved ones, who have close to them during these days of pandemic as we hear the numbers rise. We pray for those that have the responsibility of tending to them, those in the National Health Service, those in care homes and others, Lord, in these difficult days. We thank you for them, we thank you for their dedication and pray that they may uh, know something of strength from you. And the Lord, we do thank you though that in these days your work can still go forth, your gospel still brings people to salvation. And we thank you still for the opportunities that the door, the doors that are open. We do pray particularly at this time for the work of the London City Mission. We thank you for the work that's been done uh, in our capital city through that organisation over so many years. And pray for that ongoing work now. We thank you, Lord, for the ministry that is, we've heard about here on so many occasions of where people are still uh, being brought to you. We do particularly this time pray again for our, our schools and our young people and the students who have returned to school and, and university in the hard days that they had. And we do pray to for those with this responsibility of teaching them and all we concerned about much that is taught in these days. And again, we pray for the protection for our we pray too for other churches in our, in our own uh, group, and you know, especially remember uh, this morning the, the work at Doors Heath. We thank you that they've been able to keep going. Thank you for Chris and others there that are carrying on the work. We pray that they too might see some fruit for their labours. And as well, we think of the, the, the world situation too. We uh, again uh, think particularly of your people who suffer most violent persecution. We particularly of both your people in Miami, where again they've suffered tremendously, along with others, but particularly some of those. Uh, groups which have a large number of Christians in them and are finding things so terribly difficult at this time. We hold them up before you and we hold up too, Lord, the ministry of those organisations that seek to be aid, uh, to, uh, particularly to your own people, but in others as well, when we remember that the food shortages around the world, and particularly again, we are people that are often discriminated against when aid is brought. Oh Lord, we 
and thank you still for those that are willing to take risks with their own lives to help your people. And Lord, as we come now and over, we think of our own needs in the, amongst us uh, uh, and those associated uh, with this church, we will have uphold before you the elderly and sick amongst our membership and former membership and friends here are now in care and for those caring for them. And we pray, Lord, for the needs of, of us all here today that you will meet our needs. I pray that you use even this uh, service this morning to minister to us. Oh Lord, we just bring all these prayers to you now, in and through our Saviour's name. Amen. Right, we now come to the reading this morning. And let's, let's do it again. Our reading this morning, there are two readings. The first reading is Ephesians. And the second reading, if you want to put the finger in the page, will be Revelation 2. So the first reading, which is page 1177 in the Church Bible, is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armour of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done with everything, to stand. Stand firmly, with the belt of truth buckled round your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flames, all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. And Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, right. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven gold lands golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered, and have endured hardship for my name, and have not grown weary. Yet, I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen? Repent and do the things that you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favour. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Okay. Okay, we'll come back to those uh, words after we've sung uh, one more hymn. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord.
the definition of the word church that he would reply. Exactly what is the church of Christ? Well, here is uh, one definition, very, very brief, but I think it's a good answer. It reads, the church consists of those of every race, every land, of every age, who have been chosen by God the Father, purchased by Christ's blood, and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And I particularly like that you know, definition because it, were, it mentions the work of all three persons in the Trinity, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in bringing people into a relationship with Christ. And that relationship is symbolised for us in a, a number of ways in the New Testament. For example, the church is described as a building with Christ as the builder and the chief cornerstone and, his, uh, and his, uh, his people as living stones. It's described as a marriage with Christ as the bridegroom and the church as the bride. It is pictured as a body with Christ as the head and his people making up the many parts. And when we speak of the church in this way, we're referring to the universal church, all the people of God down the ages. And that is how the word church is used in many places, as I say, in the New Testament. And that is how the Lord himself was using it when he said, this is from Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall, uh, shall not overcome it. But the, church, the word church is also used to describe a congregation of Christian believers meeting at a particular lo location. And in fact, it's used more often in that way in the New Testament. Many of the letters contained in the New Testament are addressed to churches. For example, the Apostle Paul, in writing both his letters to the Corinthians, addresses them to the Church of God in Corinth. And of course, when we come to the book of Revelation, the Apostle John was commanded to send all that he wrote down to the seven churches in specific locations in Asia Minor, which is modern Turkey, uh, starting with Ephesus and ending with Laodicea. So then that there is this distinction. The word church can refer to the universal church or a local congregation. Uh, and some people have sought to explain this di distinction by using the words invisible to describe the universal church and visible uh, to describe a local congregation. Then these are not biblical terms as such, but they're quite uh, a useful way to highlight the difference between the two. In using the term invisible, we realise that only Christ himself knows who are truly his, who are those who belong to him, who have repented of sin, put their trust in his saving work, and now have a real relationship with him. We, on the other hand, are fallible and cannot be certain. We can only observe people from the outside. Christ can see the heart and knows the, the, those whose faith is merely a profession and who is, gen, who is this genuine. And to give an example, I think, why we have to understand this distinction between visible and invisible, consider those words of Christ, with which many of you would be familiar, they're addressed to the church in Laodicea, in Revelation 3.20, where, where Jesus says, here, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Now you may well have heard that verse used as a text, as a gospel message, as an invitation to accept Christ. However, some have argued that the verse should not be used in that way simply because the letter itself was addressed to a church, so the recipients were all be Christians. 
But to this we can reply, yes, it was sent to a church, but to a visible church, where the people would not necessarily all be Christians. And that would be especially the case at a place like Laodicea. <clears throat> and in addition, that appeal was made to individuals within the visible church. So it's quite in order to use it as a, as a gospel invitation. From all this, then, we conclude that it's possible to be associated with and be in regular attendance in a local church and not belong to the true invisible church, the one that Christ is building. Jesus himself warned of those who would on a future day would expect to be welcomed into his kingdom, but to whom he would say, I never knew you, away from me, from me you evil doers. I would add at this point that someone may be thinking that if, all the, uh, import, if the all important thing is to belong to the invisible church, which is indeed the case, is there really a need to belong to a local one? And we do come across people from time to time who think that way. In response to this, we will have to say that the New Testament takes it for granted that every Christian will join together with other Christians in the membership of a local congregation. For only then can the implications of common membership of the, uh, of the one church of Christ find expression. So this morning I just want to share some thoughts about these letters to the same churches named in chapter 2 in, in, uh, in 2 and 3 in the book of Revelation with a particular emphasis on the, on the church in Ephesus. Now I know that I've recently been studying the Revelation in our Bible studies on Tuesdays um, and I've attempted to speak on this subject before. But it does no harm sometimes, I think, to simply be reminded of truths that we already know, or should already know, uh, and especially when you, you get to my age. In fact, I was looking at the second epistle uh, of Peter the other day, where he mentions this subject of remembering and, and forgetting uh, several times. For instance, uh, in chapter 3, verse 1, he writes, Dear friends, this is now a second letter to you. I have written them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesale thinking, wholesome thinking. So, now, the, book, the whole book of the Revelation uh, was written by the Apostle John in obedience to a, a manifestation uh, of Christ that he received in exile on the island of Patmos. And this manifestation or vision was of the risen and glorified Christ and is described in the first chapter. Everything that John wrote, was he was instructed to send to all these seven churches, namely in chapters 2 and 3. But first of all, there was a separate little message for each of the churches individually. Probably most of us, if we are honest, are much more familiar with the contents of those early chapters of Revelation than we are with the rest of the book. That's, still, that's probably still the case, despite studying the whole book recently uh, in our Tuesday evening Bible studies. As you read these letters, you notice that they each follow the same format. If you set them in a row, side by side, this will be immediately evident. However, the church is concerned, are nevertheless very diverse, especially regarding their spiritual standing. Now, although the overall message to each is, is different, there are three statements that are made to all of them, all seven churches, uh, statements which are exactly the same, they're identical. But before we come to these, I want to mention one thing that is said to this church at Ephesus uh, only, one thing that's uh, unique to them, and also one which it shares with four of the remaining churches, um, and then th three, three which it, it shares with all the churches. First then, what is said to this church in Rome, this church at Ephesus? Uh, actually, you might consider it two things, but they're closely related. Look at what they're actually commended for, and wait for it, they were commended 
for their intolerance and their hatred. Verses 2 and 6. Now, how does that go down in our present day world society? Of course, such intolerance is not directed at individuals, but against their actions. But in these days, many to say that you disagree with someone that may be considered hate language. But no, there is such a thing as holy intolerance, as opposed to a, to a tolerance which is merely weakly giving in to wickedness, because we do not have enough zeal for God and righteousness, uh, God and His righteousness, to withstand it. It is an intolerance that, that has no compromise with evil especially false teaching, which is the issue here. The church knew how to recognise her heresy and then to deal with it. Uh, with one of the other churches, the fire at Tyre, the reverse was true. If you read what Christ had to say to that church, they were sentient for actually being tolerant when they shouldn't be. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a proper test, they were told. She was guilty of false teaching and the, the church was not stopping it. Ephesus, though, was still down uh, sound with its doctrine, but sadly appears cold as well. It had lost its first one. <coughs> Next we come to the, something that this church had in common with four of the other churches. The two churches that are not included here are the two churches that are not censured by the Lord at all for anything. Uh, they're some some in Philadelphia. So what did five churches need to do that two didn't? There's just one word here. I find out here. What do you think that one word was? Any suggestions? No. Well, the one word which appears in five of these epistles, they're, they're <coughs> is repent. And we cannot overstate the, the importance of this. When John the Baptist commenced his public ministry, what was the first word on his lips? Repent. When Jesus began his public ministry, what was the first word that recorded that he said? Repent. It was the same. When people on the day of Pentecost came under a conviction of sin at the preaching of Peter and asked what they should do. What were they told? Repent. When Paul was preaching on the Mars here at Athens, what does he say commands, God commands all men everywhere to do? Repent. You cannot get away from it. And from those quotes, we should not conclude, though, that repentance begins and ends at conversion. As Christians, we continue to sin daily and need to continually repent and confess our sins to our Heavenly Father. One former pastor of mine used to say, always keep short account with God. We now come to the three things in the letter to Ephesus that are in all seven, uh, all seven letters. The first one of these is those opening two words, the spoken words, I know. Christ is going to tell each church something that he knows about them. Of course, in reality, he knows everything about them. He is the all seeing, all knowing Son of God. You never do anything, say anything, write anything, even think anything that is not known to him. He knows our inmost thoughts. We read in the first chapter that his eyes were like blazing fire. But in each case, the, the, in these letters, he's going to tell them something that he knows about them and has a, a specific reference to their situation. That may be comfort in some cases, like the church at Samaria, where he starts by saying, I know your afflictions. On the other hand, in the case of the church like Sardis, where he says, I know your deeds, you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. And that probably came as a great shock. The other two statements, which are common to all seven churches, both come at the end of each letter. The first is the words, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
The other is the promise of reward to the person who overcomes. The actual reward, though, being different in each case. We will look at the overcomes first. The question is, what does it exactly does it mean to be a, an overcomer? You know, I cannot explain this any better uh, than uh, by quoting some, some extracts from a, 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 a commentary where the writer says, Every professing Christian is a soldier of Christ. Armour is provided for the professing Christian if he will only use it. He, went, he then quotes those verses we read earlier from Ephesians 6 about putting on the whole armour of God. And then he continues, the professing Christian has the best of leaders, Jesus, captain of our salvation, through whom he may be more than conqueror. The true believer is not only a soldier, but a victorious soldier. Victory is the only satisfactory evidence that you have a saving religion. How goes the battle? Are you overcoming the love of the world and the fear of man? Are you overcoming the passions, tem tem tempers and lusts of your own hearts? Are you resisting the devil and making him flee from you? How is it in this matter? There is no middle course. You either conquer or be lost. He then quotes several examples in the scripture I'll just mention three. When Moses refused the pleasures of sin in Egypt and chose affliction with the people of God, this was overcoming. He overcame the love of pleasure. When Daniel refused to give up praying, though he knew that the den of lions was prepared for him, that was overcoming. He overcame the fear of death. When Matthew rose from the seat of custom to our Lord's bidding, left all and followed him. This was overcoming. He overcame the love of money. What was the secret of their victory? Their faith. They believed in Jesus, in Jesus and believed him were made strong. And then he concludes, resolved by the grace of God to be an overcoming Christian. I think that all speaks very well. Uh, for itself, doesn't it? I found that quite helpful because I think when we were going through the, with the variation, we had a, a little bit of difficulty with the, with the overcomers. And we now come to the third statement that appears in all certain letters. He that has an an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Consider the opening words of that statement. He that has an ear, let him hear. Do those words remind you of something? How often Jesus used that expression in the Gospels to call people's uh, attention, especially in connection with his parables. The parable of the sower is recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and all of them include those words. They appear eight times in the Gospels altogether, and then for seven more times in these letters. There's 15 mentions of all. Now in the Gospels, it is Christ who is speaking these words. Now, it is still Christ, and there's the spokesman here, of course, and not John. And this letter begins, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and walks among the seven golden lampstands. And this identifies Christ himself, again, as the speaker. You see that from chapter 1 and verse 12. And likewise with the other six churches, the speaker is identified as Christ by the description in chapter 1. So these words are the word of Christ. But the text then says, it is the Spirit who is speaking to the churches. And I'll come. Well here we have a demonstration of the unity within the Godhead, the Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. The words of the Son can also be taken as coming from the Holy Spirit. So all of these letters are, are to an individual church. But if we vary the question a little and ask, not who are they to, but who are they for? Then it opens it up much wider. For although each church has its own separate letter, all the letters will be gathered together and included in the one book and available to all. 
Når du når du så er det så begyndt at vi har sådan en eller anden ting her, men det vil jo så at kort til Taiwan og hvor det vil blive sendt as well as churches. At this point, it comes out very clear in the early in the in the first chapter of Revelation in verse three, where it says, "Blessed is the one who reads the the words." Of prophecy, of this prophecy, which means the whole book of Revelation, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. So this whole book is for anybody who is willing to read or listen. It is sometimes asked whether these uh, churches are actual churches or merely typical, especially if uh, there are seven of them and the number seven features. So much in, in Revelation, but it seems quite reasonable to say that they are both. They were clearly genuine historical places that existed at that time. At the same time, they display typical elements that have been found in churches throughout history. What they do is to help all churches in any age uh, to give themselves a sort of spiritual health check in the light of what Christ says about these churches. What would be his uh, verdict about our church, perhaps, at the present time? Or perhaps you visited the, the, your doctor because you know you have something wrong with you. Your doctor then finds something else wrong of which you were unaware. Some of these churches must have been oblivious as to their spiritual state. In the case of Ephesus, that lost, lost, uh, loss of first love probably developed gradually over a period of time time and went unnoticed. Uh, that church was founded by Paul around 57 AD would have probably been about 40 years old by then. A new generation would have arisen. Now what, what has all this to say to us as a church? Broadly speaking, what it says to every church. Just as there is a need for individual uh, Christians to do some self-examination from time to time, to be willing to let the searchlight of God's word, uh, as it were, to come to bear on their lives, so churches should do the same. We regularly report on how individuals or organisations are faring, but what about us as churches at home? Are we together getting stronger in our faith? Are we together growing in grace? Are we together going forward, or perhaps standing still? Are you falling away? These sort of questions may become particularly important now if we're going to start looking for something different by a way of pastoral oversight. Well, to conclude then, if some of what we've been looking for this morning sounds a bit negative, remember that for the most part we've been looking at the visible church, which is not perfect. There is still that invisible church that Christ is building. The gates of hell will not overcome. And that, that church is growing all the time, every day. And Satan can do nothing to stop it. He is powerless to stop new stones being added and powerless to remove any that are already there. When the last stone has been added, then Christ himself will come again. And the, and the overcomers will receive their promised rewards. Let's now rise and sing our final hymn, which is A Breath of Life and Sweet in Friends.
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and always.